Hello and welcome to Deeply Curious. My name is Cody Jensen and joining me in our New York City studio apartment is my wife, Sarah. Hello. In this podcast, we're going to be diving into our favorite quotes yes. and talking about them. But I have to say, they are going to be some of our favorite quotes for Sarah. Yeah, because... I picked like 12 and I have like 12 million, so. <laughs> and there's, there's absolutely no way that Sarah could say, these are my favorite oh, no. quotes. These are my favorite quotes I found just now. Yeah. <laughs> is, I, more, yeah. is more like it. I, if you don't know, quotes are my love language. Absolutely. So. <laughs> she has uh, documents. I have notebooks full of notebooks. quotes. You, have, you even have uh, three ring binders yeah. that you've, uh, what do you call that? Transcribed mm-hmm. quotes into. Yep. So I'm a quote fanatic. Sarah loves quotes. Mostly, um, I will quote you to oh. you um, oh. <laughs> because uh, quotes basically give language to what you feel. So yes. you, you find a quote that you really love and the reason you love it is because it, it like encapsulates. It hits like, your heart just right. Yes. Yeah. And you're just like, ah, oh, yes, that's exactly what I've always felt or always tried to say or whatever. And because some people are gifted with the gift of prose. <laughs> yes. They've already written it. <laughs> and we can use it to, uh, I guess... Help to ourselves. Help ourselves and help others understand us in this world. Yeah. So I had this idea to bring some of our favorite quotes yes. and just basically just dive deeper into them, talk about them, talk about why we love them and what they mean, um, yeah. maybe dissect wherever that leads. Yeah. But before we jump into that discussion, I want to let you know that this podcast is sponsored by season one of the new Amazon original series, Jack Ryan, Ooh. starring John Krasinski. Yes. He is uh, in the show. He is not John Krasinski. He, uh, he is um, <laughs> Jack, Tom, Ryan. Jack Ryan, Tom Clancy's uh, character based on a Tom Clancy book. Um, and he is a CIA analyst that gets into some antics and terrorism. Things. It's really good. And it's eight episodes for the first season. And it is I would say like a mini series more yeah. than like you, you get to watch it and, you know, not feel like, oh man, you know, yeah, basically. Well, there's like a bazillion books yes. on this character. I don't actually know how many. So but. that's, that's, that's <laughs> the way to say it is that this season is one of the books. Yeah. I would assume. Yeah. But it is very good. It's like, um, it's cinematic. It's like a movie. Yeah. Um, it definitely, if you enjoy War, terrorism, advi- not adventure. Uh, yeah. That kind of vibe. Twists and yeah. turns in mystery yes. type stuff. Um, and then, if you enjoyed John Krasinski. Yes. Like, just in general. But Jack Ryan <laughs> is exclusively on Amazon Prime. And if you want to check out season one of Jack Ryan, you can do so by signing up for Prime by going to prime.deeplycurious.fm. And... I know you are a smart person and you can figure out how to sign up for Prime on your own. Yeah. But if you use this exclusive address, prime.deeplycurious.fm, it helps uh, track who is actually going to it from listening to the show, which ultimately is what uh, supports the show. Yes. Um, I know you're a smart person. You don't actually need to go to that. But (laughs) if you wouldn't mind, please use prime.deeplycurious.fm if you're going to sign up to watch. So... Quotes. Quotes. You know, uh, there is a famous uh, quote about quotes hmm. that are, that is, uh, quotes, quotes, they're good for your heart. The more you read, the more you're smart. <laughs> Bye. Me. <laughs> His name is me. I don't know. It's oh, weird. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> they, no, no last name. No last name. Yep. Just me. Yeah. Um, well, do we, do you want me just to pick some and go from there? Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll start with Sarah. Sarah has way more than me. So How many do you have? Uh, like two? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Well, let's see. I'll just do this one because I really like it. I don't feel like there's going to be a, a lot of conversation to be had, but it's one of my favorite quotes. Okay. Um, it's by Zadie Smith, who is the fiction writing queen. That's just generally understood. Um, She says, novels can make you think, but if they don't make you feel, there's just no purpose to them. And that (laughs) is a me quote. I love it. Anyways. Me wrote that one too? Yeah. I know. Crazy. (laughs) 
Um, yeah, I just like, I like that, um, because it's, I think that's, is the point of fiction is mm-hmm. to like feel things like there's this, there's this quote, um, and I can't remember who it's by, but it basically says like, um, fiction gets at the truth when you can't like face the truth or something like that. Mm-hmm. And it's about how like stories really like, cause you get so engrossed in them that you're not paying attention to, you know, what it's doing to you or what you should be thinking or what you should be doing. And instead you just like feel them. Mm-hmm. And that's like the truth of it. Isn't that nice? That makes me think about, so I think that plays into an argument for good fiction versus bad fiction or just Mm -hmm. maybe not bad fiction, but just fluff. I would say fluff fiction, pure entertainment fiction. Right. Yeah. Um, And in like deep fiction. Yeah. But more so what it makes me think about is nonfiction versus fiction and how a lot of us myself included in many seasons of my life mm-hmm. that i was i pushed aside fiction of like i don't have time to read fiction i have all yep. these nonfiction books that i want to learn that i want to read because uh, you know if i'm going to read i might as well be learning something learning something and getting something out of this yeah. but i have learned over yeah. uh the you know how many ever years yeah. um that fiction can be just as impactful maybe even more impactful sometimes than yes. nonfiction because of the story aspect and the way that our human brains really like wrap itself around and crave mm-hmm. story. Mm-hmm. We're able to actually take what we got out of that, I think even farther. Yes. Like sometimes I read a nonfiction and I'm like, oh my gosh, yes, highlight, 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 highlight. And then a few months later, I'm like, oh, I see the, I'll see that book on the shelf and somebody's with me. And I'm like, yes, that's such a good book. But then I'm, then I'm thinking like, but I don't really remember why. Yes, I have always felt this way. Because I'm, I'm a huge nonfiction reader too. I don't just read fiction. Um, but all of my friends that, I don't really have a lot of like, reading friends who are super into fiction like I am and they're always like yeah well if I'm gonna read something I should be learning so I'm gonna read nonfiction." but it's true like you don't you don't actually remember all you're just like taking in information and your brain doesn't retain it I feel like whereas fiction it's tricking your brain and like it, it may take you longer to realize that you've learned something or that something has impacted you but it stays with you I think in a fiction book. Mm-hmm. For example, I have I have a few nonfiction books that I rank in my top favorite books, like um, Donald Miller, Erwin McManus, that kind of thing. But the things that impact me the most that I continue coming back to are all fiction, mm-hmm. all of them. Yeah, it's because like we, as we go about life, we can um, like we something happens to us. And then it, it sparks a part of that story, mm-hmm. which then enfolds of us thinking about the whole story and what happened to that character, the character's decisions yeah. and like the outcome, the moral, the, you know, everything. I also, it. yeah, I also feel like because fiction uh, teaches you empathy mm. because you are actually, it's just like if you go to a movie, like you're getting lost in the story or you're putting yourself into the story and it fiction i they say like reading teaches you empathy but i really think fiction teaches you empathy Mm -hmm. and i think that is maybe the main thing is because when i'm having like a real life struggle and i can't figure out a situation i find myself in pieces of fiction books in characters and i like learn lessons from them and i like figure out how to apply that to my real life you know and i think that works in fiction more than it does nonfiction. Nonfiction is just like teaching you information. And I don't know, it's just different. Yeah. So anyway. Wow, that was more of a discussion than I thought. <laughs> um, next. Next. <laughs> um, well, we'll do it. This is a C.S. Lewis quote. I only picked one because C.S. Lewis has a lot of quotes that I really like. But this one is, um, someday you will be old enough to start reading fairy tales again. I think that kind of applies to the last quote that we just talked about. It also really applies to the conversation we have with John. Yes. um, About growing up. Yeah. I think um, it's just such a beautiful way to look at it. Like, oh, why did we grow up and think that, like, kids' books or fairy tales aren't for us anymore? Like, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It's a good reminder to 
I don't know believe that yeah you can still read fairy tales <laughs> and, and i'll re- restate the when i we did a podcast with john hill all about growing up and like mm-hmm. we, are things are there things that we should grow out of blah 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 right. and basically it goes right back to this it, this quote is a summation it should be the description of that podcast <laughs> yeah um but one of the things that i said in there was i was listening to this american life i believe um they were talking. They were telling stories about death, and there was this old lady that was basically, uh, uh, she was, death was staring her in the face, literally, because she had been given a specific like you are, you only have X amount of time to live, oh. and whenever she was given that diagnosis, she said, so what I decided to do was to just start reading all of the books that I loved yes. as a kid and spend time with the people I love. Those were the two things mm-hmm. that she wanted to do. Like once she knew, like, I only have this amount of time left. I'm going to, I'm going to quit worrying about everything else and read the books that I loved as a kid mm-hmm. and people. Yeah. Along those same lines, C.S. Lewis was talking, he talked about that. He said um, something about like when you turn 50, like the books you read as a kid will be just as or more impactful and enjoyable like at age 50 than they were when you were a kid. There's something about like, just like accepting and like, like childlike wonder, like that's Mm -hmm. a thing, you know? So I like this quote as a reminder that like you can read fairy tales and it's fine. Like you don't have to be an adult per se. (laughs) Yeah. So some things that I have my favorite quotes. Yeah. Um, let's start with Steve Jobs. Of course. Um, so, Steve Jobs, if you don't know, is, well, I was going to say if you don't know is one of my heroes, but if you don't don't really know, Steve Jobs is the uh, <laughs> the founder, creator of Apple Computer, um, yeah. longtime CEO, died of cancer. 2011. 2011. So, I have a, t- a tattoo on me of an Apple logo because of Steve Jobs, because of the the... The inspiration and basically in the same way that we started this podcast of that quotes put language to what you feel. Mm -hmm. Basically, everything that is innately me, Steve Jobs had was embodying. Mm -hmm. And like I would be thinking these things, not to say that I'm the genius that Steve (laughs) Jobs was, but just on the micro scale of just like the, the way that I felt the the most important things maybe like right. in, in design or the most important things in life or whatever it's like steve jobs was, was already doing those things and so yeah. he became like inspiration right like he shares me. the same design values i think that you do right yeah and so i was looking up steve jobs quotes to you know i already already had a few that i knew but i wanted to make sure like which ones were my favorite and when i was looking them up i found these two quotes mm-hmm. and whenever i read them the first thing i thought of was if Steve Jobs is not an Enneagram 8 like myself, <laughs> um, then I don't know what he is because... Okay. Um, number one, Steve Jobs, quote, mm-hmm. I do not adopt softness towards others because I want to make them better, end quote. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> I didn't know he said, I mean, I've read a bunch of Steve Jobs quotes because he, he does have really great like design philosophies, but I've never seen that. And that is so <laughs> you, not in a like bad way, but I mean, I've literally said that basically that quote. Yeah. I mean, you and I have had those arguments because I, I am a little more sensitive to those things. <laughs> and so you've I mean, yeah. It's like I'm trying to make more you or less. I'm to inspire those are you. the exact words that you <laughs> use. <laughs> um, so that one was like, whoa. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's me. Um, secondly, quote: mm-hmm. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. Yes, I have read that quote, and I really like it. And that is like my. That's your it, stick. Yeah. I mean, if you are a longtime listener of Deeply Curious, mm-hmm. you've heard me talk about uh, uh, other people's opinions and the opinion of man being placed on your life uh, many times because it is a core pillar of mm-hmm. my personality and who I am. Yes. And the blatant disregard I have for what anybody else <laughs> thinks yes. I need to do or say. Yes. And 
uh, I think that this beautifully mm -hmm. encapsulates, don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. Yes. And that is so freaking true mm -hmm. that we all have who we are inside. Yeah. And we let... It, and this goes even back into the conversation we had last week about social media is because that mm -hmm. social media is everybody else's opinion. Right. And we have ours that is our own inner voice and we take in, take in, take in, take in, and we're not filtering mm -hmm. what we should and shouldn't be listening to. Mm -hmm. And that is drowning out what we actually think, who we actually are, which, you know, I don't have any scientific proof to back this up, but that makes me think like, well, maybe that's what leads to the group think that mm. we have in this country right now, or maybe that we've always had, yeah. of that we're letting, we're bringing in so many opinions that are slightly mm -hmm. attuned to ours, which then the, the next opinion that is slightly less attuned to ours comes in, and then the next opinion that's even farther away comes in, and then we end up thinking as a group, right? even though if we actually broke it down into yeah. what we actually believe, we would disagree with most of them. Most of them. Yeah. It also reminds me not of the group think, but just that quote of the, in the social media, I guess, commentary. Um, I can't remember who said it, but I heard it on a podcast and she said one of her major tips or things that she tries to live by is to create before you consume. Mm -hmm. And it's that idea of like, being true to who you are and your art and whatever art that is, but like creating whatever you are before you consume everybody else. And so that you're not letting other people's opinions and th views and even, even words, like if you're a writer, for example, this is something I'm trying to do is like write before I get on social media. So I'm not letting other people's words, um, Influence. manipulate or yeah influence my words so I, I write how I write instead of like oh they said this like this I should try and write like that you know you're not like trying to be something else yeah anyway so true um so whenever I read those two quotes by Steve Jobs and it made me think that he was an Enneagram 8 that made me look up uh -huh. what Enneagram experts you know maybe think he is mm -hmm. and interestingly enough the things that I found were essentially that it is nobody actually knows, obviously, right? Because um, he's not alive to right. you know type himself, so it's all outside opinion. And the experts that have looked at it um, flip flop back and forth between mm -hmm. a four, oh, or a eight wing seven, oh. Or a seven wing eight. They they don't know if yeah. he. They, oh, so Steve. some people they basically they say that he might be equal parts seven and eight. Yeah. And so it it's a toss up whether it's an eight wing seven, which is what I am, or right. a seven wing eight. Right. Um, but there's so much of the seven and eight mm -hmm. in him that they, it's definitely. Yep. A, that like a seven wing eight, eight wing seven type thing, or a sexual four. I was gonna say although yeah because I just recently learned that. Well, no, because it's hard to explain the Enneagram. Yeah, we're, we're not, not going to get into yeah. that. <laughs> this, if you want to know, I'll tell you. But yeah. it's it's a it's a lot of information. But the reason <laughs> I'm actually bringing that up um, is because I was interested, and that is interesting to me because those mm -hmm. are Sarah Our and I's types. types. Yeah. And so I'm the next Steve Jobs, everybody. But, Although I I think he was probably an eight. Yeah. People yeah. say that a lot of his personality traits really do not fit within a four. No, they don't um, at all. And so especially the opinion of man, th like there's so much of him that's like confidence. Yeah. That I feel like like not that it and boisterous yeah. and loud yeah. and and like a four you know. is very like creative, artistic, that kind of thing that Steve Jobs was, but yeah. um, they tend to like. You know, second guess themselves and crap like that. Yeah. So, but now uh, I'll do one of the actual quotes. Actual quotes. <laughs> um, but before that, uh, if you're hearing a lot of background noise, is because New York decided to rip up the street in front of our yes. house, and there's no good time to record this podcast without uh, lots of noise. <laughs> Sorry. So we don't like it either. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, it's not coming through that loud in the mic, but it's pretty loud uh, in real life. Oh, another. Uh, quote actually that I pulled that was very much me, mm -hmm. um, just that kind of 
goes with the possibly Enneagram 8 situation. Mm -hmm. Don't get hung up on who owns the idea. Pick the best one and let's go. Yeah, you are so about that. Because even like, you very much believe like my idea is right until I hear a better one and then I don't care. Like, right. which you're, is exactly you're very how not, Steve was. Yeah, you're very not married to your ideas, I guess, as long as there's a better one. Right. Yeah. I will, I will fight for the best idea no matter who it came from. Yes. And generally i believe that my idea is the best one like right initially. but you're not but you're not afraid to admit when right. you hear a better one right you're like oh yes that's it let's do that mm -hmm. and then I, I will you will go for it own that idea and, and follow through yeah you're and very so, much like that anyways I, I missed that in the earlier so <laughs> another quote uh just to talk about is I think the things you most regret in life are the things you didn't do. Mm. What you really regret was never asking that girl to dance. Yeah. And I really liked that quote because, again, that is something that we already say. I think, believe mm -hmm. we probably even talked about it before on the podcast. I'm a huge and believer so, in doing things. And so I, I think Sarah and I, mm -hmm. we, we have said this so many times of you only regret the things you don't do yeah um because even if you do something and one you fail mm -hmm. or two it sucks mm -hmm. um or it's you have a, a bad a experience bad time. or yeah. <laughs> whatever whenever that thing's over even though it wasn't pleasant necessarily in the moment right you never regret it never but if you were oh, okay so let's say it it was uh, I, I think the example we use a lot is vacation. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm a huge believer in experiences. So I don't really count work as experiences. Like, that's something, that's like building something versus, versus experiencing something. So I always go to, like, travel and vacation and stuff like that. But it's true, like, well, for example, when we went to Iceland, I think we've used this example on the podcast, mm -hmm. and it was freezing cold it was like the worst i have never been so cold in my life and it was raining and the wind was like a hundred miles an hour definitely the strongest wind i've ever felt it was felt. literally being blown across the you know and like it was miserable right like we it was miserable i don't remember that at all like when i think back on iceland i'm like oh it's so pretty there we should mm -hmm. go back you know i never think about how miserable i was and i do think like even if it was a bad experience, even if it was like miserable legitimately and you can't remember the pretty parts of it, mm -hmm. like you learned something, didn't you? Not only did you learn maybe a lesson, but you learned something about yourself. You learned that you can actually handle things and you can, like when you're thrown in the midst of something, you can stand up and it's fine, you know? And to, to even just piggyback off of Steve Jobs' uh, example yeah. of, you know, you, you regret not mm -hmm. asking that girl to dance. You, you walk up and you ask the girl to dance and she says no. Right. Literally, that's the worst that can happen. Mm -hmm. And then two, now you don't regret it. Like, because you're not going to look back in, in, in later in life, you know, it's 15 years from now and, you know, whatever sparks that memory and you're like, man, I wonder what would happen if I would have asked her. Yeah. Now it's like, you know, and you probably never think about it. Yeah. <laughs> because you already know, like it already happened. Yeah. And it's like, oh, okay, cool. Well, it's not supposed to happen. Whatever. Like yeah. you can just move on. Like it's even fine. if maybe you're hurt for a minute, but. Right. Even if the, basically it gets down to, even if the thing that you do ultimately is a negative experience, mm -hmm. it's, you don't regret it. No. You only. It turns into yeah. a story, which. I mean, story is king. I, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. the story is everything. To be able to have that story is better than to, like, worry that it might not go, you know? Yeah. You only regret the experiences that you don't have. Mm-hmm. Which, I guess, sort of in that same vein, since that's what we're talking about. Um, there's a quote I put down by Jack Kerouac. It says, because in the end, you won't remember the time you spent working in the office or mowing your lawn. Climb that mountain. I think that's, like, you know... You're not going to forget or you're not going to remember like the mundane, the normal, whatever. So just like make time to do the cool experiences, you know, prioritize yeah. them. Yeah. This one is by Philip Roth and it says, like all enjoyable things you see, it has unenjoyable parts to it. And I really like that quote. It's kind of like a bummer quote, which 
is fine for me. I like sad things. But it's a really good reminder for me. Like I was just talking about like who cares about the mundane stuff. I really like I feel like if anything is mundane, it's not worth it, which isn't good, right? Like not every your dream job is not going to be all dream 100% of the time. There are going to be things that you have to do for your dreams that you hate. It's just the truth. And I I don't understand why people don't talk about that. But (laughs) like nobody loves to sit there and do email for two or three hours a day or whatever. But it has to get done in order to build what you're building. So I like that as a reminder that like just because this particular task is unenjoyable doesn't mean it's not worth it. You know what I mean? Right. I don't know. I have a really hard time remembering those things. So... (laughs) Um, so that plays well into another quote that I pulled. But before I w- say the quote, yeah, more want to say. So I only pulled quotes by two people: Steve Jobs, and then the second one is Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. Right. Um, both of these guys are people that very much inspire me. Mm-hmm. And Ludwig Mies van der Rohe is a German-born architect, designer. I mean, that that those would be his two like main. Yeah. Yes. Titles, um, artist. Very mid-century. Yes. Beautiful. Um, And he is accredited with two really famous quotes that everybody knows. Mm -hmm. Um, And both of them are actually not originally his, but he is Mm -hmm. like accredited with bringing them for for their fame. They are famous because of him, even though he probably got them from centuries old poems or from mentors or whatever. But uh, for what you're saying in the mundane, yes. one of the things that Mies van der Rohe um, said is God is in the details. Yes. And what is, this is so, I love this quote because I really resonate with it and I believe it's true mm-hmm. that ultimately, you know, you have your project, your design, your whatever it is, and you you know, you do the the bones, the, right. the the structures, and all of that. But the thing that's going to make the thing mm-hmm. is the details. Yep. And the, the you know the reason he says God is in the details is because essentially the greatness, the glory, the yes. the ultimate, the victory, you know, the thing, yeah, is in those details. The things that are so, you know, I don't know. You have to get down in the minutia mm-hmm. and and get into. The mundane essentially right of of all of that stuff but if you get the details right that is what leads to the most powerful mm-hmm. works and the most successful right things and this was very much a steve jobs thing too mm-hmm. he was so incredibly mm, particular particular and tyrantial mm-hmm. is that a word i don't know and being a tyrant about something um <laughs> uh about the details and, and, and you know it's famous for caring just as much about how the inside mm-hmm. of his products you know looked, looked as as the outside you know how the circuit boards and how everything was laid out and how it, it doesn't just need to be slapped inside of a gray box mm-hmm. it needs to be perfectly designed and every single detail needs to be you know if you were to break it open Right. You would be impressed by how beautiful... It would be art itself. Yes, the yeah. inside is. Um, anyways, that's kind of a tangent. God is in the details. It plays off of the mundane because it's just so... True. Yeah. <laughs> it's it. I mean, you can't build the thing, the big thing, unless you do all the little things underneath it. Right. You know? And if you, if you truly put as much care into the details as you did about whatever the opposite of details is. Yeah. The broad things. Well, I would say the vision, right? Like people are really, they're like, oh yeah, I know what I want. It's this thing, you know? But Mm -hmm. then they don't have the discipline to like do those small things that will create the big thing. So then they're just like chilling all day, you know? Interestingly enough too, is that Ludwig Mies van der Rohe is also accredited with the quote, less is more, Mm -hmm. which... I mean, to have God is in the details and less is more under your name is... They're like... like, Yeah. Like, those are 
prolific to the sense that they're hardly even quotes anymore. They right, just they're are. just a thing. <laughs> Everyone knows it. <laughs> and what I love about the fact that Mies van der Rohe said these things is, one, because they're awesome. Two, because uh, these are things that have always been me. Right. From, I mean, ever since I've known myself and ever since you've known me, mm -hmm. you know, it's just like in everything that I did, I was always about the minimalism, but more so just finding the core of things yeah. and, and less it's is like more. It's like carving away to the the detail, the, the truth right. of the whatever. And in that, the, the reason that I am saying that I love that Mies van der Rohe said this is because these were things that were already me. And then you and I took a trip mm -hmm. to, to Chicago. And this is where I very first even heard the name Mies, Mies van, der van der Rohe. And so we're driving around and we're getting these tours of all these buildings. And there are these beautiful mm -hmm. architecture buildings um in in chicago that are under the, they're called the international style and i was just so drawn to them and i just like just was looking very at them clean and, and loved them yeah and then i learned that mies van der Rohe designed them and then i started looking into mies van der Rohe stuff and then i learned that he did the farnsworth house which if you want to see basically my dream house mm -hmm. scenario um just Google look up it. the farnsworth house yeah and so i essentially fell in love with Mies van der Rohe's design and mm -hmm. everything that he's ever done. And then later I learn that he freaking said the quote. Yeah. Less is it more. It goes back to what we were saying at the beginning about how like you read a quote and it just like fits, like it just feels like home or whatever. And that's, I, you know, that's exactly it. You you like know of these quotes, you learn of this designer, this architect, and it just, it feels like a... Uh, Oh, what's the word? Like spirit animal. Mm -hmm. Like he is your spirit animal, yeah. you know? <laughs> or like you and right. him are the same, cut from the same cloth, right. you know? Um, it's a good feeling. Yeah. It's it'd be like he became basically my favorite mm -hmm. architect, one of my top heroes, like type guys, like with Steve Jobs. And yeah. then I learned that these quotes that I've always loved are actually him is just really, I don't know, fun. Yeah. Just um, anecdote. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, this is gonna like change the subject a little. Um, th so there's this book that Elizabeth Gilbert wrote called Big Magic, and it's all about creativity. And this is one of my favorite quotes from that book. She says, do whatever brings you to life then. Follow your own fascinations, obsessions, and compulsions. Trust them. Create whatever causes a revolution in your heart. Isn't that nice? I love just that last line, whatever causes a revolution in your heart. Like, it doesn't really matter if it's, you know, something big, something small, something that'll last forever for a few hours. Just, like, it resonates with you, so make it, mm -hmm. you know? Because a lot of times we create with the audience in mind. Yeah, which we talked about on last week's podcast, yes. specifically with social media. You know, we're creating for an algorithm and like what gets the most likes or what we think people are going to love the most. Yeah. But like really you should just create what you love and then like the people who are again the same from, cut from the same cloth as you they'll find it, right. you know. And they'll appreciate it for what it is. They'll appreciate it for you. Yeah. And I didn't write this quote down so I don't know the how to paraphrase, but Steve Jobs is also famous famously said that if you create for the customer mm -hmm. that by the time you get the product out yeah the customer will will, will have already moved on yeah like basically the customer never knows what they want and if you create for what they want by the time you get it to them they will want something else yeah he's yeah he's very well known for saying like i or not i but like we determine what they want mm -hmm. like we're going to create something ahead of its time because they don't even know that they want it yet basically yeah. yeah it's a fantastic yeah, and, way and of looking at things and if you're creating for what people want now right then they you basically are going to miss the boat yeah yeah you're not being and on top of that you're not you might be relevant but you're not being revolutionary you're not mm -hmm. being innovative you're just like another fish in the sea you know yeah which isn't it plays into to that quote but it's more so because, I mean, most people are not creating uh, product lines that are right. months out or years right. out or whatever. I mean, that, that, that's a, a small group yeah. of people. So more so 
just create to create. Yeah. And create what you love, create what you want to see, want to watch, want to hear. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the day, if you love it and it's like yeah. y you write the song mm -hmm. or you write the book and when you're done the next morning you want to listen to it you want to read the book because you love it so much yeah. even though you you wrote should it. be your biggest fan right <laughs> yeah like it sounds conceited but that is true it is and, true you know, people say that all the time um especially in music they're like mm -hmm. are you listening to your own band and mm -hmm. they're like of course they should be listening to their own yeah. band because it should be that should be the 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 most favorite, their favorite band of all time right, should creating, be themselves. Like if yeah. they're being true to who they are, being true to their art, yeah. then they're putting out what they love. They're mm -hmm. putting out their heart. Mm -hmm. And if they have their heart in a song, then- Why wouldn't you listen to yes, it? Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's your heart. I totally agree. I think like, I also feel like, especially because of music, like this is, I don't know if this is like a mean thing to say to all other art, but I feel like music is like the truest art form like there's something like really um like deep and like soul about music that I don't find or I don't feel in a lot of other art not that I don't think it's there but like it just doesn't resonate as much with me as music does I feel like if you're putting out your soul in music form like <laughs> mm -hmm. you should be a fan of it right. you, you should be and it's wild that they were like well you can't love your your own stuff yeah okay <laughs> yeah if if you basically i would say also if, if nobody's you, gonna love anything they're only gonna love it to the point you love it you know uh i mean i mean if you're not like i think with 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 end products i think that's different i i would say that you are right in creating something like if you're yeah. if you are creating in the creation process and you're creating right. something or you have a dream or you have a passion or whatever the people who are around you right are the they're only going nobody is going to be more excited about that thing than you are so That's you have to set about. the bar but you can absolutely create things that people will love way more than you will yes um, well that goes back to the um john mayer thing yes yeah because john mayer um said on his hot ones interview that he he creates the the, the the pop hits mm -hmm. for everybody else but then he does the 16 chord do diddly yeah that he gets to have you know a lot of fun and yeah. it's he's passionate about it he does those for himself and he said like i hope one day right that those will be the same that you know the things that they'll that, pop the, off yeah the, the the things that i'm passionate about like pop off but he also it's not that he doesn't love the other ones right but he's like passionate about guitar yeah and he's passionate it's like about the, the most intricate the more intricate the guitar the more fun he has right but those tend to be the not to be the ones that people right. like because people want simplicity yeah um yeah. and he knows that yeah <laughs> so but he, he i i both. think that that's good like to be able to recognize yeah. that kind but of stuff. but what i was really getting at so i think that you can create things that you don't like that yes um, you can the, the other people love and essentially what i was gonna say is if you are creating anything mm -hmm. that ultimately you don't want to consume mm -hmm. i think that is whenever you flip into being a sellout mm. yeah it's like if you are a commercial success but you're creating exactly what you want to create i wouldn't call that a sellout you know people People talk about that. People say right. the, the, those things are like, oh, I mean, they, they're top 40, whatever, blah, blah, blah. They, they just sold out. And, yeah, but you know, if they love it. But I would say that isn't the case. My opinion would be that if you're creating things that ultimately you don't want to consume, mm -hmm. that's being a sellout because you're just creating to feed the monster, to yeah. feed capitalism. You're going with what the, numbers. what the status quo, I guess. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And quote me on that. <laughs> Um, okay, I want to do this quote because it's one of my favorites and I don't want to run out of time. Um, it's David Foster Wallace, which I have a ton. I think David Foster Wallace had really great commentary and quotes and ideas on modern American life, which I really have an affinity for all of his stuff. But this one specifically, I really love. Um, You've probably read a whole book of just 
Without, of just his quotes. Yeah. Yes. Like, I love, like, he's just so... He like, was, have you finished a David Foster Wallace book? No, because they're so wordy. Right. They're but like, you've read enough David Foster Wallace quotes to, to match the, the, the word count. <laughs> oh, for sure, yeah. Um, I love him. Mm. And if you haven't seen End of the Tour on Netflix, highly recommend you watch it. It's about David Foster Wallace. Anyway, um, his quote says... Look, man, we'd probably most of us agree that these are dark times and stupid ones, but do we need fiction that does nothing but dramatize how dark and stupid it is? In dark times, the definition of good art would seem to be art that locates and applies CPR to those elements of what's human and magical that still live and glow despite the time's darkness. Really good fiction could have as dark a worldview as it wished, but it'd find a way both to depict this dark world and to illuminate the possibilities for being alive and human in it. It's wordy, I know. But it's essentially saying, like, life is... And I think, obviously, we can apply that to right now. Like, David Foster Wallace committed suicide in 2008. But everything he talked about, everything he wrote, was so indicative of where we are right now. And I feel like, you know, saying, like, these are dark times and stupid times is not far-fetched. Like, it's wild, the times that we're living in. But the point of art, of good art, is to find that that thing that is still hope right within it's like everybody agrees that like times suck right now in a lot of different ways right but the the point of the artist is to illuminate what can still be good Mm -hmm. and i think um it's just a really hopeful quote while also like acknowledging that like things aren't great you know Mm -hmm. the the line of Really good fiction could have as as dark a worldview as it wished, but it'd find a way to both depict the dark world and to illuminate the possibilities for being alive and human in it. it reminded me, or made me think about an example of the the book that I haven't read, but the movie that I have seen <laughs> of <laughs> extremely loud and incredibly close. Mm-hmm. And so that is a uh, movie slash book that is about 9-11, which is obviously the darkest right thing in an hour lifetime right but the story in mm-hmm. which is told throughout that dark period is so it's beautiful beautiful and uplifting and 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 shows a picture of the human condition mm-hmm. in a such a dark time mm-hmm. that you that leaves you feeling hopeful i guess yes and and i basically it just, I think that is a perfect example of what David Foster Wallace was saying in that line. Yeah, I totally agree. I think there's there's so much, so many quotes on this subject, I think, that I keep thinking of all of these things. And I'm like, ah, oh, it doesn't matter, whatever. But I think being able to say, like, wow, everything sucks and it's all doomed is, like, not conducive to anything. Mm-hmm. And the, Well... It's easy. It's it's easy, yes. So the hard or the the real work, the real art is in finding something that you can be um, hopeful about in all of the mess. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to find John Mayer actually posted an Instagram story about this. He was kind of talking about like the same idea. He says, I'll say this again, the world, all of our worlds, is like a snow globe that somebody shook. It is very difficult to make great, authentic, honest work right now. I have spoken to other artists about this, and lots of us agree that it's like we can't find a vein. My point here is you won't know for a bit whether you're out of ideas or just practicing a vital kind of artistic survivalism. I still believe it's possible and that we will find the vein. I think like that's that's the whole point of good art is like you're just sifting through all of these like emotions and like oh my gosh everything is doomed and whatever to find that vein to find the thing that is like worth it and good Mm -hmm. anyway yeah i just think it's a really hopeful way of looking at how bad things are (laughs) (laughs) well yeah i mean i think it's really just about pessimism versus optimism and and it's the point of life i think yeah, and and basically how it's much easier to be a pessimist, mm-hmm. um, and how because of the human condition, mm-hmm. we can much easier just like fall into negativity and mm-hmm. you know the, the pessimistic v- out, uh, outlook. Yeah, on life, but I think great art comes by 
obviously going against the grain of mm-hmm. the world because if you're creating art that is in the exact same flow mm-hmm. that the rest of the world is in, then your name is Thomas Kincaid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like you're not really you're not changing much. Right. You know, you're just creating you're literally creating the color blue that n- nobody mm-hmm doesn't like it right like it's the most equal common denominator is is negative negativity essentially i also think like you can't have the hope without or the light without the darkness right that's harry potter Mm -hmm. um which i was thinking harry potter is a perfect example like a perfect fiction example of what we were just talking about yeah like its entire plot is dark one to seven yeah is ultimately darkness mm-hmm. and but then finding that that hope and that twinkle right among the darkness and you know out of the end and ultimately right. light prevails yeah and i think it's kind of like the bible what <laughs> <laughs> it's it's um harry potter is easier to read though <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think that that's like it's kind of it may sound like a bummer a little bit but i think that's like the whole point of life is like Things are hard and being alive is difficult a lot of times. Like it's it's not an easy road, right? But but like I don't know, the, there's something beautiful in being able to find hope in that. And that's the whole point yeah. of everything. And I I would argue you can't find the hope without the darkness. Like you can't understand the weight and the beauty of everything without the weight and the dark of everything. Or at least you can't appreciate it. Right. Actually, one other quote I had written down that kind of goes along with that is by Lois Lowry. And he says, from a book, says, And you know what, thin elderly, sad parts are important. If I ever get to train a new young dream giver, that's one of the things I'll teach. That you must include the sad parts because they are part of the story and they have to be part of the dream. Hmm. I think that is exactly what I was trying to say. Like, you can't have the the light without the dark right you have to include the sad parts because that's what makes i mean even if you look at like success stories like they always had there's there's the the character arc you know like you have to go through something terrible in order to come out the other side of it yeah you know and if yeah it makes me think about that if you hide from the darkness and and basically anything difficult anything difficult you are just building a facade mm-hmm. and you become, you know, the, uh, the suburban housewife <laughs> picture yeah. you know, that we have in popular culture. Of yeah, like the smile and pretend the, you're happy. Right, the two and a half car, the two and a half kids, yeah. the two cars, you know, the, the perfect lawn with the white picket fence. And, you know, you, you're creating this image mm-hmm. of perfection, but ultimately it is sitting on a... Uh, pile of debt uh, let's Mm -hmm. say um that nobody sees that you know one pin drop of extra right on top of that will crumb the whole thing right crumbles um into bankruptcy um, yeah to keep the metaphor going um but i I think that i've seen many examples of that Mm -hmm. in my life and in popular culture of if you hide from it and you you choose to essentially like avoid Mm mm-hmm Anything that is potentially hurtful, right? You live a shallow life. Yeah, quote me on that. <laughs> I I'm a huge believer in going deep. So yeah, and even it, if it's sad, even if it because like I said about experiences, like you're gonna learn something about yourself or about the world, or so you're gonna take some nugget of truth right. away from all of that. Because it's like and avoiding- also just be real and authentic. Like I don't I don't understand why we're all so like, oh my gosh, everyone's gonna hate me because I'm telling the truth and like I'm being vulnerable. Like mm-hmm. just let's all just be truthful. And like the more likely outcome in that scenario is that somebody people are gonna s- step up and say, Oh my gosh, thank you for telling yes. the truth. Yes. I can't believe I'm not the only one who feels that way. Mm -hmm. And I just, especially in social media, it's very much about highlight reels and putting your best foot forward and all that stuff. And I'm just over it. Anyway, I I just think you have to, like this said, you have to include the sad parts. I agree. Anyways, (laughs) moving on. (laughs) So I probably should have just brought this quote up earlier, Mm -hmm. but I wanted to do, you know, back and forth and not not take away from your time, you know? Yeah. Uh, so 
This is my only... I have a few more Steve Jobs quotes, but we'll just save those for another time. We have enough quotes that maybe we could. this could be an ongoing series, essentially, yeah. like that we come back to of, of talking about quotes that we love. But this is my only non Mies van der Rohe and Steve Jobs quote, but they absolutely both love this quote, and I even know <laughs> that Steve Jobs uh, quote quoted this. <laughs> and... I have said this many, many times because I think this is my heart. Mm -hmm. Perfection is achieved not when there is nothing more to add, but when there is nothing left to take away. Yep. You're a huge fan of that. I am. Um, Which that quote is by Antoine Antoni. Antoine. Antoine de saint Exupéry. He wrote The Little Prince. That's interesting because I thought he was, I thought this quote was like, hundred years older than what the little prince is but obviously not nope. anyways <laughs> um so perfection is achieved not when there's nothing left to add but when there's nothing left to take away mm-hmm. and that is very much what i believe especially in design that in you know if you look at great design mm-hmm. and this is the design of everything not just graphic design right not just product design and the design of everything the products that are timeless Mm -hmm. are those that are to their core simple yeah and you know take a piece of graphic design for instance like a flyer for something (laughs) yeah if that flyer has five fonts on it it's too much the you know amateur designer that was doing that was thinking oh look if i add this and add this and add this it makes look me, me. Look, look like a great designer yeah but ultimately it makes you look like a terrible designer because a good a great designer knows when to stop yes or knows what to take away essentially like you yeah. add everything if you want to begin with but it's just like in writing, mm-hmm. you know, you can't edit a blank page. You you know, you throw everything to the page right. and then you edit and edit and edit until you're at the core of what you're trying to say. Yeah. And that's the same thing with in design, you know, you, you have this flyer and you're trying to advertise for somebody to come to your, you know, it's, it's a concert flyer or something. Right. And it's like, there, the main objective is one, draw attention Two, let people know what band and where it is, where to get tickets. You yeah. know, it's like, and if you can, if you as a designer can communicate that, in two seconds Mm -hmm. boom it's like draw attention you know band you know when Mm -hmm. like that is great design right you know and so in the same thing with uh you know the reason steve jobs and ludomix mix van der roe definitely loved that philosophy and quote is because it applies you know again back to the mac or back to the iphone everybody has a phone and you're and you're maybe even listening to this podcast on your phone right now and if you hold your phone and think about it it with it off Mm-hmm. It is literally a slab of pristine glass mm-hmm. with, you know, uh, as a Johnny Ive would say, you know, chamfered, uh, polished, <laughs> stainless edges. And you, you know, yeah. you, you flip it over and it basically, you know, possibly, it's probably there's not even a headphone jack anymore, you know, because it's down to its most simplistic core. Right. And there is nothing on that phone that is useless right or that is overcomplicated or that shouldn't be there right it has been brought down yes to nothing left can be taken like if you if you took away one more thing it would be useless like there would be something that you couldn't do correct um but then you know the screen comes on and now everything is interactive you know on, on the actual you know, device or right. in, in, the, in the software itself. Right. But again, the software that wins is the one that everything that is extraneous has been stripped away. I would say the one that's intuitive right. that you don't have to figure out. You just inherently know. And the only way you in, intuit mm-hmm. is if there, if you don't have to sift through everything that you don't need. Correct. What you need is there. What you don't need is somewhere else. Yeah. It reminds me, maybe not uh, talking about... It's a bit of a soapbox if you couldn't tell. Yeah. <laughs> if, maybe not talking about phones specifically. I'm not sure. It's it's related. I don't know exactly where it fits. But it reminds me of sculptors. 
because they start with, I can't remember what I read this in. Actually, I think it was Drop, Drops Like Stars by Rob Bell. He talks about this a lot. And, um, but basically, sculptors start with a, a big square slab of marble or whatever it is and they carve something out of it Mm -hmm. the thing that they're find the yeah they find the thing in it by just chipping away and i think um that's what it that's what that quote reminds me of yeah it's like the marble could be anything and everything but right now it's just a square of marble and like they're chipping away to find the sculpture within it right you know also when you were talking about writing and like editing down your words i wrote a quote down but i thought well this isn't really like something worth having but it fits um it's ernest hemingway and he says my aim is to put down on paper what i see and what i feel in the best and simplest way Mm -hmm. anyway i just wanted to share it because i wrote it down but i thought maybe it didn't have a place here (laughs) (laughs) but i found it but i found it (laughs) and if it fits it sits (laughs) yeah but i think that is true about everything in life really not just design Mm -hmm. but like the whole point of like well it's just about like knowing your values right and so like you pare your life down according to what is most important to you you get rid of crap that is just like causing chaos in your brain you know like if your house is cluttered get rid of the clutter if you're you know what i mean Mm -hmm. like things like that i think you can apply that to literally every aspect of your life right because your life is a work of art right and you know, it gets into the topic of minimalism, which, I mean, I would consider ourselves to be minimalistic. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say, I'm a minimalist. Well, but the only reason I, I wouldn't say I'm a minimalist is because it's essentially like saying, I'm a vegan, because there are yeah there are toxic minimalists, Correct. essentially, and they're in the same way that they're toxic uh, vegans. Everything else. <laughs> and so, you know, if you say, you're a minimalist, and they're like... What do you, you own a plant. That's not minimalism. You know, yeah. It's like, <laughs> yeah. because essentially with minimalism, just like with everything else, it's like there is minimalism up to the point in which it is for your own benefit and for your own good. Right. And then there is minimalism down to the point that is to your own detriment. Yeah. You and can go too far. You can go too far chasing a ideal. Right. But ultimately, we yeah. don't have to get into it. But just, yeah. We we would consider ourselves more on the minimalist side, and this is what you're talking about. Yeah, perfection is achieved, and not when there's nothing left to add, when there's nothing left to take away. Mm-hmm. I think that if people brought that philosophy mm-hmm. into their life and into their American consumeristic life, yes, we are all because of our society, because of our culture, mm-hmm. we are all brought up to believe that there is something that we need to add to our life mm-hmm. to make us perfect yeah and that's what all advertising is is. yep all advertising is saying by this you will be better by this you'll become more perfect yeah and ultimately with just like with everything else that we i've just went on a soapbox about yep you instead of thinking of instead of looking at ads instead of looking at what you should buy what you should add to your life to make your life better look around and say oh wait Mm-hmm. If I actually start stripping these things out of my life, it'll make more room mm-hmm. for me to do the things that make me happy. Yeah. I think you can also, just as another example, apply this to your um, entertainment. Not just like physical things, but like what are you consuming on Instagram? Like I went through and unfollowed a bunch of crap that like it was there was no point to it, you mm-hmm. know? Um, also, like, TV shows. We are very specific about what we watch and when. We're not just, like, consuming a bunch of TV. We're, like, picking one show, and we're watching that one show from start to finish before we do anything else, you know? Like, I think that just being intentional and being aware. Yeah, because um, with that example of the, of the TV, it's so easy to get caught up in the peer pressure of of the world right, right now, like, where oh my gosh, everybody <laughs> everybody is getting on you know some sort of you know bandwagon mm-hmm. essentially of this show, and everybody's talking about it, and you feel like in order for you to contribute to the dialogue of culture, mm-hmm. that now you have to watch the thing, and maybe. That thing is is great. I mean, it right. probably is. I mean, I mean, I, an example for us was House of Cards. Mm-hmm. I didn't watch House of Cards until season four or three, 
And then I caught up because I felt like I was missing out. But it ended up being really incredible. Yeah, but more of what I'm getting at is not the fact that the show is bad or good, like, you know, quality-wise, as, right. as far as, like, is it a good show or not? It's more so, are you giving up the things that actually... So let's say, right. just to give an, just an arbitrary example, let's say you're super into creating model trains, mm -hmm. and then the show comes along that everybody at work is talking about, and instead of spending that one hour or two hours or whatever, you know, meticulously mm -hmm. designing your model trains, you're watching this show, which ultimately is a good show. Like, there's right. you, you don't have anything against it, but... It doesn't energize you to the level in which doing your model trains is. Right. It's then taking away. It's taking away ultimately what energizes you. Right. And so you're like, it's, it's almost a different conversation than what we started with, but it's, it's well, pairing that it's just, out. It's just yeah. like, it's just knowing what to take away. Yeah. And that it's okay if you haven't seen the show. Yeah. It's okay if you don't can't contribute to the a conversation the, that ultimately doesn't matter <laughs> the conversation that ultimately everybody is going to forget when the next show comes out right because did, yeah. binge watching you can't remember anything anyway oh everybody gosh. remembers they watched it but nobody remembers what it's about whenever <laughs> season two comes out and they're like watching and like, wait that character died when <laughs> yeah i think yeah it's just about treating not just art but like your life and like like a work of art and paring down so yeah i think entertainment counts in that especially in the culture that we live in i think everything is designed to keep us like in front of it and mm. like to keep us consumed and like you should just be self-aware enough to like look at that to, to control like, your own life yeah and I to mean, say everything. like okay why am i doing this like is it actually good for me do i even want it like i think yeah. that's the point and it, everything, all media, all, really everything, is all designed around our primitive brain mm -hmm. to where we we almost can't even control it. Like, that's why it's right. so easy to watch hours and hours and hours and hours of television or YouTube or scroll Instagram and everything for ever. Like, literally, you could just never stop. Yeah. And it's not your fault. It is your brain's fault essentially like it's your primitive brain's fault or uh it's the it's uh it's the man it's the right. media man yeah um you know controlling like putting out essentially what it is is you know tv let's say netflix mm -hmm. netflix ultimately wins right. by you spending more time on netflix than you do on youtube Correct. than you do on twitter than you do on whatever mm -hmm. and every single other person that i just named they win when you spend more time on YouTube than you do on Netflix. They spend yeah. you spend more time watching ABC shows than you do watching NBC shows. Right. Everybody wins by you spending more time with them than with anybody else. Right. And so everything is designed it, literally TV shows are written mm -hmm. so that something like they have studies and they yeah. have studied us anthropologically <laughs> and said it we need to make sure that we put a joke every you know, however long 3.2 yeah. minutes or we need to put a cliffhanger you know every that's why the, you know there's always cliffhanger right before the commercial yep. you know and the art is being written around how our brains are structured to keep us watching so so there's nothing it's basically what i'm trying to say before you read whatever you just found yeah. is it's not your fault right but you have to recognize that right become self-aware and essentially uh, enter the matrix and say, I, 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 I know, I know the man is there and yeah. I'm going to fight against it. And exactly. I'm going to set the screen time allowance on my, uh, new iOS 11, 12, 13, 11, I think. 11. Um, and you know, because I know that my brain is not, uh, uh equipped right. with its own <laughs> tools to stop. Right. And so I have to bring external tools into my life to stop me from consuming myself yes Quote me. um <laughs> you really like saying that <laughs> um it just reminded me so like i said david foster wallace has a lot of quotes about modern america and consumerism and blah 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 and we were talking about advertising and how all of it is designed to keep us engaged blah, blah. um there's this quote that he has specifically about advertising that i think well i really love because it's literally the truest 
Um, he says, it did what all ads are supposed to do. Create an anxiety relievable by purchase. Hmm. That's what every, all the consumeristic right. things that we do, they're all creating an anxiety that we feel we need to relieve. And the only way to relieve it is by purchase or by watching or right. by whatever. And so I think if you just like keep that in mind as you're like scrolling Instagram and see these ads that are directed towards you like Mm -hmm. (laughs) just remember like oh maybe i don't need that they just want me to need it you know yeah it's because ultimately all products are trying to solve a problem but what we don't realize is a lot of times we don't even have that problem right the company made us feel like we have the problem and now we now they have to now we need the thing to fix it and that you know that is kind of a that is an entire category of advertising and it's basically anxiety based or fear based advertising to Mm -hmm. say this thing is happening. This thing is wrong. This thing is falling apart. But look what we got. You yeah. know, the world is ending. Look, I have a survival bucket that you can buy for thirty nine ninety nine. Lasts for fifteen years. Um, yeah. You know, it's like doomsday basically. Right. But you know, on everything is on a smaller scale right. than that. You know, is you know, there's there is literal so doomsday buckets you can buy. But yeah. you know, subconsciously, like you're saying, everything is selling that. Yeah. Everything is selling that. You're not quite pretty enough, but... Right. I have this concealer that will help. You're not quite skinny enough, but mm-hmm. this will make you look skinnier. Yeah. You know, and that type of thing. And then to bring it even on a grander scale, what people don't realize is look at politics and look at, you know, specifically, like, no matter what you believe politically, just look at the campaign right. of Donald Trump and look at what he, you know, did. He was creating the fear Mm -hmm. and then what is the product that is going to eliminate this fear it is himself and so he's saying basically every single stump speech every single you know time he was talking the first part is selling you on how terrible america is Mm -hmm. because of but i'm gonna make because of whatever Mm -hmm. it's like selling you that america is terrible america is terrible but guess what i'm gonna make america great again yeah you know and so that's creating a um creating a problem that that isn't actually there Mm -hmm. and selling you on that he's the only solution to the problem right and so this is not a new thing, right? And it, it's it, it, it's prolific. It's in everything, right? It's basically all advertising, in, yeah. including, you know, politically. And yeah. th- and that's not to even single. I mean, that Trump is a great example because it's so it's so polarizing. Well, it's it's very it, obvious. Yes, it's so obvious. Like yeah. that. That's the thing. Is like it's it's such a great example because you don't he wasn't have to, shy about it. You don't even, you don't have to be some expert or like right. some self-aware person, you know, to like study and be like, oh yes, he's like doing that. And then mm-hmm. he, he crafted it into this whole thing. It's like. he's te- He literally tells you yeah, what he's doing. <laughs> right. It's like, <laughs> tells you right up front exactly what he's doing. I'm selling you this and I'm mm-hmm. the solution, you know, and it's like, but what I was getting at is this is what, this is way older than Trump. Right. Yeah. It's not a new thing. I think, but I think. It's, I mean, it's essentially every politician ever. As, like, yeah. on both, like everybody is selling, oh, yeah. you know, or creating well, the problem not even, to... Not even politicians, people. Right. People are saying, like, well, they're selling themselves to you, right? So there's there's got to be a reason that you need them. Whatever their thing is, like, their book, their whatever it is, there's a reason you need it. So mm-hmm. I think, like, advertising or whatever in general has always been a thing. Um, but I, I do think it's gotten... It's just so... <laughs> There's so much of it. Like, it's it's wild. Yeah. So I think just understanding. I don't think advertising is necessarily bad because there are things that I find through advertising that I do need, that, do, that does solve a problem for me. Mm-hmm. But I think just being aware yeah. that, like, that's their whole goal, their whole point, and then, like, really criticizing and looking at what they're selling and why you need it. Yeah. You know? We should probably end because I feel like I could talk about this for yeah. so long. It's not even funny. I think this is but good. We can, we'll, we'll do a, a more of these. Yeah, I think it brings good conversations. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to end on this quote by John Green, who is probably my favorite author, but this quote is not about a book or anything. Um, it says, maybe our favorite quotations say more about us than about the stories and people we're quoting. Mm-hmm. So there you go. I mean, that is... 
Absolutely. I mean, that's basically what we started the, this with. That yeah. you know, the quotes bring words into what we feel. And if you look at social media, mm-hmm. and you replace the, the the things that we are quoting with the things that we are retweeting, mm-hmm. the things that we are liking <laughs> yeah. or sharing on Facebook, yeah, typically are saying we're trying to say more about us than we are trying to say something about the, the thing, thing that we're, you know, sharing. Yeah, because we're all just out there looking for something that, like, resonates and, like, looking to be understood and, like, yeah. seen in some way. And even if it's just by words from somebody else from a 100 years ago, like, mm-hmm. you feel seen when you read the exact words that you were thinking but couldn't put into words, right? Yeah. So, like, that's the whole point. So I think, like, I don't know. It's something – I also like – the idea of like paying attention to what other people are saying or retweeting or quoting because it tells you something about them yeah. on a, in a little bit deeper level than if they had just written something. You know what I mean? Yeah. So um, another piece of irony, if um, you are looking for something else to watch, <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, you know, if you have, you know, a, a space in your life and you enjoy television mm-hmm. and you want, you know, uh, a recommendation from us it yeah. would be uh, to check out Jack Ryan um, on Amazon Prime by going to prime dot deeply curious dot fm. If there are things in your life that bring you more joy and more happiness than watching TV, please go do, do that. those things. I think the point is that like obviously TV is art too, right? Yeah. Like, so I think just like again understanding what is what art is valuable to consume for yourself. Yes. So, uh, and Jack Ryan is fantastic. <laughs> but even if you uh, don't want to watch Jack Ryan and you do want to check out Amazon Prime, you can do that at that web address as well. Like I said, I know you know how to find mm-hmm. things. Um, but if you would like to try out Prime and you also would like to help us, um, I guess, keep doing this, we would love that. Then use the exclusive web address, <laughs> prime.deeplycurious.fm. All right, that is the end of this show. Um, we, I think this was a great conversation. If you like this uh, kind of idea, idea, maybe we could do a, a part two sometime or just keep it an ongoing series. Let us know by hitting us up on any social media platform or on the YouTube comments. Yep. And thank you guys for listening, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.